Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater Adventure. Hello and welcome to Adventure Bike TV. Now I'm going to start the show the same way I did last month and talk about facial hair. Now for those of you that were dissing the beard over the last month, I must just explain that I needed to grow it so that Tom can use it to focus the camera. Honestly, it's the only reason. Not really, honestly, it is. But anyway, enough of that. As always, it's time for the bike review. Now we listened to what our viewers said on Facebook and we're bringing you what you wanted. All mounting brackets are polyurethane lined to minimize noise and vibrations. Metal Mule. Engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. Have you got a sad, an empty man cave? An empty man cave that would be fulfilled by the presence of an iconic adventure bike. An adventure bike that is equally at home on the tarmac and off-road. An adventure bike that you could get a stunning example of for under five grand. But we think we've got the perfect bike for you. And, it just so happens that that perfect bike is the same bike that our viewers voted for as one of the three bikes, along with the AJP PR7 and the Yamaha T7, that they wanted to see reviewed on the show. That bike is the Yamaha 660 Tenere. <laughs> Now all three bikes got exactly the same number of votes on the show. The PR7 is a bit tricky to get hold of because we're not even sure they're going to be selling it in this country because it doesn't have ABS. And the T7 is, uh, what can we say, it's in high demand at the moment. Now you may remember Jay Hurst from the show when he was doing this. This a naked. Right, so in the absence of naked people this time around, you've got your bike with you, we have. Array, which I know you bought from you. So just explain to me, what was it about that particular bike that made you decide to go for that one? Um, actually, it was a friend of mine. He had, he had uh, a massive interest in the bike and we went to have a look at a couple together as friends, um, just traveling around, having a look at them. And I wasn't that actually that interested in them. Um, and I just fell in love with it over, over a period of time. Okay, yeah. and I know you've done quite a few bits to it, so there's some bits of it that aren't standard. What kind of things you've done to it? Um, I've, I've done things like I've, uh, I've added uh, pannier racks, I've changed the exhaust system, I've put a better bash plate on it, I've put handlebar risers on it, um, Renthal fat bars, um, better hand protection, things like that, just to make it a bit more rugged off-road and uh, less likely to break if I, if I do come off it. Right, and we were talking earlier today about the kinds of things you've been using it for, and I know People always talk about adventure bikes never getting used for adventures or being used off-road. <coughs> You're an ex motocrosser, you can you can ride bikes off-road. So what kind of stuff have you been using it for? Um, I've always said, anyone who asks me about the bike, I always say it's a Swiss Army bike of knives. It'll do anything you want it to do. You can commute on it, you can go for a Sunday blast on it, you can go and get muddy in streams. You, you can just do anything with it. It's just a fantastic bike just to ride around. Is there anything that you would say would be, not, not necessarily a negative, but the things that you like less about it there are there are a couple of little niggles with the bike uh the cush drives wear very quickly so you either need to mod them or do there's a few little mods you can do with them uh, with like bits of inner tube and stuff like that to make it a bit better uh they they suffer a little bit they've got like a little flat spot 
uh, as through the rev range but you can't just ride around you get used to it and ride around all they've all got it apparently so that that's the only really real two niggles that i've got about it i think yeah. Of course, the proof of the pudding is always in the eating, and we are going to go and ride the bike, because of course I'm going to have a go riding it, but it's Jay's bike, so I'm going to let him do most of the off-road riding, because uh, just in case I drop it. All right, let's get muddy. Let's go. <laughs> hasn't been around quite as long as the northeastern Niger desert that it takes its name from, but it has been around in various guises for a long old while. In the mists of time, we had the XT500 and then the XTZ600, which at the time was one of the most popular Enduros. It grew and developed with the XTZ660 between 1991 and 1999. The XT600Z Tenere that we've got our mitts on today sprang forth from the fruity loins of the iconic 90s bike and has been in production since 2008. Now, I've got to hold my hands up and say that I started with pretty low expectations of this machine. I'd heard bad things about a vibey engine, top heavy weight, lackluster performance, odd seating position and even some fuel injection glitches. However, as I walked up to the bike, I liked its looks. I liked it a lot. It reminded me of tall fronted rally bikes, which I've always thought look the dog's what's its. It looks like it's going to do what it says on the tin and does it ever. I love the fact that it's got the built in front towing hoop. It's stating the bike's intentions in quiet but firm tones. It says, it doesn't matter what you throw at me, I'll find a way out of it. Come on, my son, let me show you just how tough I am. I can handle anything, come on. This bike is like adventure bikers from the last 10 years. More of us than ever are taking on better and better challenges, even though we might just be a little heavier. But we're so much more sophisticated. Okay, so back to the real world again. To be entirely fair, this particular bike has handlebar risers and an acro exhaust system. So the off-road stand-up geometry felt bang on for me, and the exhausts take quite a handful of kilos off the top weight. It's only 185 kilos dry to start with, so this bike might well be down near 175. And the seat is remarkably comfy for a bike of this stature. It shares the same engine with the 2006-14 MT-03 and post-2007 Aprilia Pegaso 650. And whilst it puts out a shade under 50 horsepower, I didn't really care. It was enough to have fun on and that's what this bike does with little compromise. I didn't really feel the much maligned vibes either. As singles go, I thought it was fine. So the forks dive a bit under braking, dual calipers up front no less, but that's just part and parcel of these slightly older adventure bikes. Jay had pointed out to me that strong rally raid type panels are fixed to vulnerable areas like the Tenere's fuel tank and engine and are designed to prevent excessive damage in a fall. Apparently the tank covers are only a few quid each and are designed to be replaceable items so you don't need to spoil the bike's scorchio ready lines with ugly scaffolding of engine protection bars. Out on the open road, that tall rally style screen makes a fairly oasis-like little pocket of air which I was more than happy to spend time in. Today we were riding wet roads with dual purpose tyres and even so, the only time I was aware of the off-road geometry was as I increased the pace of the turn and the front tended to tuck in a little but it did nothing to hold my fun. This is a bike that importantly isn't trying to be anything other than what it is. I really liked it. It's not fast, 
but it's fast enough. It's a proper modern dual purpose machine. It doesn't compromise road or trail performance at the expense of the other. You could ride it to work Monday to Thursday, ride motorway to central France on Friday, and then drop your bags off and do some rallying across the whole weekend. There's not much in this capacity and price bracket which could boast that. It doesn't really compete with the Triumph Tiger, which is a far more road biased machine. I'd say you'd be glancing between a CCM 450 and maybe a KTM 950 Adventure. But the CCM would be more expensive and you'd shake your nuts off at motorway speeds. The KTM is 20 kilos heavier, it won't feel as good off road and you'd be buying a much older bike. You could argue for a Husky 701 or a 690 Enduro R, but they'd be less forgiving on tarmac and your wallet. The 660 kind of stands out on its own in many ways. It is its own little bubble of genuine dual sport adventureness. Is that even a real word? Oh, who cares? It does what it says in the tin. I said that earlier, didn't I? I did. Now I'm answering my own questions. Second sign of madness. Okay, well, we've been riding the bike um, in the drizzle, although it's not too cold today, which is quite good. And I have to say, I was really pleasantly surprised by how much I like this bike. I'd heard stuff about how vibey it was beforehand and that, you know, actually quite a lot of negativity around it, but I really, really enjoyed riding it. And I think the under 50 horsepower actually doesn't matter. It pulls really strongly. It's, it, it's fun to ride. And even though on paper with fuel, a full tank of fuel, it's 205 kilos, it felt much lighter and it feels, particularly Jay's bike, because it's got the handlebar risers, like a bike that is really built to go off road, which it is. It's a genuine dual purpose bike. And I think if I was going to think about that kind of class of bike, dual purpose, under 800cc, I'd be struggling to think of a bike I'd rather have. And obviously, Jay, you bought it, you got it, you love it. Yeah. You agree with all those, all, agree with all those things? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, with, with any bike like this, tyre choice is a, is, a big, uh, is a big factor when obviously buying new tyres. Um, I went for the new Anarchy Wild now that they do for 21 inch front. I just think they're, they're brilliant. It just emphasises the strengths of the bike so much better. It handles so much better off road. The tyres give me the grip I need in the wet, well, today, um, with all the drizzle and stuff like that. It just seemed planted, and I think it, it's just the way to go with it. Or, you know, tyre choice on, a, on an adventure bike is very, very important. Yeah. And what about the things you've got left to do with it? What have you got left to do? There are a few things I want to do to it. I want to change the front end. I want to put the uh, WR450 front end on, single brake, disc conversion on the front, upgrade the rear shock, uh, and try and um, change as much stuff on it for titanium as I can, just give it a bit of a weight loss, send it on a bit of a diet. We all need one now and again, but uh, it definitely uh, needs to go on a bit of a diet, I think. Cool, okay. And I guess I'm gonna finish off with uh, my usual question, which is, will I have one of these in my garage? And it's an equivocal yes. Our panniers are built from the highest grade, two millimeter aluminum. Metal Mule, engineered to be different. Proud sponsors of the bike reviews on Adventure Bike TV. Thanks so much to Jay Hurst for bringing along his 660 Tenere. I really enjoyed that bike, I think a lot more than I was expecting to. Now it's time for another quick update about Touratec. On last month's show, we talk quite extensively about Touratec in Germany and some of the challenges they've been having with their insolvency. Now we've had an update directly from Herbert about warranties. I'm going to read you what he told us. Distributors have to take care of warranty claims. He is responsible to replace goods or to get them repaired. Here there are no changes with the insolvency. We asked, long term could customers be left without a warranty? To which the answer was no. And Herbert continued. And he was specifically here talking about, first of all, Turatec products, and then he references products that were not made by Turatec, as in third party products. So with regard specifically to Turatec products, he is saying, we can sell new products to the distributor, but the warranty claims will be handled on a list after the period of insolvency. For all other parts, so these are parts not made directly by Turatec, 
like Touratec suspension or Touratec waterproofs or riding gear, so not produced by them, the manufacturer will repair or replace the warranty claims. That takes a little longer than usual, but makes no changes to the procedure. We also had this update directly from Touratec UK. Just to clarify, nothing has changed from Touratec UK's point of view. As the production in Touratec headquarters in Germany continues at full force, all our customers can still rely on the proven Touratec quality. I would like to reaffirm that business operations remain unchanged in Touratec UK. We are still getting deliveries on a weekly basis. We can assure you that all orders have been processed, like usual, to ensure you can realise your adventure on two wheels. At this time, all warranties on new products remain the same. Our Touratec UK customer satisfaction is at the forefront of our business. This ensures that Touratec grows year on year. So that is a response directly from Touratec UK. Now I'd just like to finish off with a sentiment that's exactly the same as we finished off with on last month's show. We believe Touratec are important for the worldwide adventure market and we genuinely wish hand on heart that they get through all this and we think the whole motorbike industry should pull together and make sure that they are able to do so. Okay, now it's time for Film School with Tom. And this month, I'm really rather envious because he's just basically larking around with drones. Hello and welcome to this month's Film School. Now in this month's Film School, we're going to be having a play with some drones. So before we get into the drones themselves, I just want to have a very, very quick chat about where you can fly them, who can fly them, do you need a license, do you not need a license. Wow, it's complicated and it's different in every single country. So I'm not even going to try and explain it because either in a month it will be out of date or it won't apply to your country. So there is an app you can get called DroneMate. It basically tells you wherever you happen to be in the world will give you an idea of what the rules and licenses are for that area. So strongly recommend that if you're gonna do a lot of drone use. So today we're gonna to be looking at the three main drones on the market and all three of them are made by DJI. Now there's a reason for this. They make brilliant drones. So the three drones we're going to be looking at today are the Spark, the Mavic and the Phantom 4 Advanced. And let's go outside and have a look at them. Okay, so let's start with the Spark. Now this isn't the case it normally comes in. So I don't have any instruction manuals because, well my wife would say because I'm male. DJI has always said that their stuff is really nice and intuitive so let's see how intuitive it is. Um, it's actually a really nice little unit to be honest. Okay, let's see how easy this is to pair. Okay, so it can't pair with this unless this is turned on. So I'm guessing we do that first. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. Hello. Okay, so I've got the app up here. I'm just going to go to enter devices. Well, it says everything's normal, but there's no... Oh, I probably have to go to Wi-Fi first. Okay, let's go to Wi-Fi settings. Scan QR, I don't have a QR code to scan. Is there a QR code on here anywhere? Okay, there's a QR code over here. QR code not clear or scan failed. Please connect the aircraft to activate. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, not terribly intuitive so far. No, still not finding it. What about if I turn this on? Okay, so now, basically, because it comes as part of the Fly More package and comes with this remote, it automatically syncs to this remote rather than uh, to that. So you don't really get a choice. I'm guessing it all can be unconnected. Battery firmware update required. Okay, it's currently sending a firmware update to the battery on the drone. Okay, so update complete. Start flight. Hmm. 
Okay, we're flying. And we're recording. Okay, let's go for a little fly and see what we can do. Not massively quick. You would struggle if you wanted it to follow, follow a bike or something like that. But scenery shots, it's quite cool actually. Nice and easy to fly on the remote, definitely. Really nice and easy to fly. No issues at all. Very stable in the air. Not bad actually. Um, so what I'm going to do is just show you the benefit of the 4K, is try and get each drone over that uh, at two metres height, which this is. I'm going to look at me. Now this is it. We can't do anything with this footage now. Uh, but you'll have a see later when we get the 4K ones, what you can do, which actually makes it incredibly beneficial. Okay, so it should now be actively tracking me. So I'm not touching anything on the controls now at all. Um, I can't go too far because I don't want my mic to go out. But it is tracking me, it's just following me. Right, I can't figure out this palm thing at all. Palm land. Stand in front of the aircraft and put your hand below it within 1.6 foot. There's my palm. One, two seconds. and it is not doing it. So the benefit is I am flying this on a very, very nice day. Um, so it's a bit hard to tell how it'd be in low light situations. It's not an amazing day, it's quite cloudy, but the sun's out and it's quite nice and there shouldn't be any issues uh, with the camera lens and stuff like that today. Uh, it should give every drone the possibility of showing, you know, the very best it can do. Okay, so let's move on to the Mavic. Okay, so when we get this out, actually it's, in all honesty, it's not that much bigger than the Spark when this is all packed up. Wow, that, that's really cool. I mean, literally, because I plugged it in, there was no hassle. Just turn the app on, it's there, it's all ready to go, it's ready to fly, so let's fly it. Right, let's go. Wow. Wow, this is a lot faster, a lot faster. Um, yeah, loads faster than the Spark. Wow. Yeah, this is really cool. Wow, this is great. Oh, I think I'm scaring some birds away. Now, this is some of that glare we were worried about with that protective cover. Now, you can remove that protective cover, but there is glare. You can quite clearly see that there as we face towards the sun uh, something to kind of look out for but as you turn away from the sun it's kind of gone that's good okay so nice comparison shot now to the spark uh, with the mavic is flying in almost identical same spot and let's have this is just the general view in in 4k um, obviously you watch this in 1080p on youtube anyway so you know um, but it does give us a bonus that without losing any quality, we can do this. Hi! So yeah, wow, this is great. This is, this is really cool. Uh, I'm gonna go play this some more. We're, we're still on 67% battery life, which is great. Okay, so now we start with the beast. Wow. Why is that thing fast? At full speed, we are getting some of the blades actually in shot, which isn't great, if I'm honest. Um, but wow, look at the picture. That's what's important. Look at that. There you have a great idea now of, of how that gimbal's working. You can see it much better on, on this drone because it's so much bigger. Again, we have 
almost an identical image. Clouds will be in different places, sun's slightly different, but only by about half an hour. And yeah, this is the picture you get from the Phantom. And of course, with 4K, we can do this. Hello! Okay, so right now, I'm not touching a thing. Not a thing. I have set waypoints on the drone, told it we're on a fly, and I'm not doing anything. It's doing this entire thing by itself. So let's see if we can film it for a sec as it's going off on its mission. And it's doing it fast. I did go, say, go at max speed, so oh, I can't even see it. There it is. Lower this time. Um, oh. Although you can speed it up as you go, apparently. And of course, we're still good on battery and we've been flying it for a good 15, 20 minutes now. On one battery. Okay, so it's changing height because I changed altitude at that point. And then it should be coming back to us. Here it comes. Wow, that's cool. That is so cool. And then my last thing where I asked it to go up really high. So the Spark will fly at an absolute maximum of 31 miles an hour and its maximum battery time is 16 minutes. So the axis is only a two axis gimbal which does mean that you're not going to get quite as smooth shots but it's still quite a good gimbal to be honest. It only films in 1080p. This is standard high definition. The downside of this of course is that you can't do any kind of adjustment within the shot as we talked about when we looked at 4K a few months ago. Now the Mavic can actually fly a bit faster, 40 miles an hour, and its maximum battery time is actually quite a lot longer at 27 minutes. It also has the full three axle gimbal, and it will film in 4K at 30 frames a second, or in 1080p at 96 frames a second. Now moving on to the Phantom 4 Advanced. So this can fly quite a lot faster at 45 miles an hour, and actually it has almost double the amount of battery time as the Spark at 30 minutes per battery. Again, it has the full three axle gimbal and its camera with that really lovely big lens is a 4K camera, which will do 30 frames a second, or it can do 60 frames at 2.7K, or at 1080p it can do 120 frames per second. This means you have a much more versatile camera with you. Now let's look at price. Now, right down the bottom, you have the Spark. Now, the Spark standard comes in at about £520 at the time of filming. However, that is only the basic drone, which means it has to be controlled through an app on a phone. But for around £700, you can get the Fly More package, which comes with an extra battery, it comes with a carry case, and it comes with a proper remote control for it. And to be honest, I wouldn't bother with the standard Spark. I would always go with the Fly More package because having that proper remote to fly it with makes it so much easier and you're going to be able to get much better shots with it. Moving up to the Mavic, you can get the basic package on a Mavic for £1,100-ish at the time of filming. And that comes with the remote and everything you need to get going. So you actually get a better all-round filming package in my opinion. Now the Mavic does come with a Fly More package as well that comes in around £1,360. To be honest, it's not as vital on the Mavic as it is on the Spark because you already get the controller and things like that. All it's really given you is a camera case and some extra batteries and things like that. Now this is where it gets interesting. You can get a Phantom 4 Advanced for exactly the same price as the Mavic with the Fly More package. So that's £1,360. However, it's big, too big to carry on a motorcycle when you want to travel around. So obviously the best drone is the DJI. The, the, the footage from that camera is just spectacular. Uh, and you'll notice it even more on days when it's a bit dull and cloudy and 
and the, the light's nowhere near as good. Um, but it does have some major faults, it's really big. Uh, which one would I have? Well, if I was going to be travelling around the world on a motorbike uh, and needed something small for my panniers, without doubt the Mavic. Um, it's got the 4K capability, it's got a really nice camera. Uh, the lens isn't as big because so it won't be great in, in um, low light situations, but you know what, it's going to be, it's going to be pretty amazing. Um, and when it's packed down to its size, it's really not that different to the Spark in terms of size, it's a bit heavier, but, but yeah, I mean, the, the Mavic, the Mavic is the one to go for. I mean, let's be honest, you can't go wrong with any three of these, but from an adventure traveler's point of view, this one just too big. Spark, there's nothing wrong with it, and if that's your budget, get it. It's a great piece of kit, but the ultimate choice, definitely the Mavic. And that's it from me. Please keep sending in your films. I'd love to see them and carry on filming. Bye-bye. Well, after Tom's successful tests with all the drones, which he uh, amazingly managed to not break any of them, it's time for an advert break. When you come back, I may have shaved. The Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Hi, I'm Tom, the producer of Adventure Bike TV, and I've been asked by Metal Mule to test their panniers to the absolute maximum and film what I've done. Now, I had two conditions. The first was that they paid me an exorbitant amount of money, and they just kind of laughed. So, yeah. The second was that I would not lie. All the tests I do will be filmed and whether the result is good or bad, I will make sure that they are made public. Now, Metal Mule were 100% behind this idea. They said I could film everything and even if the test goes wrong and it doesn't work, I can still put it online so everyone gets a completely rounded view of the panniers and I personally am not contracted in any way to tell a lie, which is a good thing. So I'm gonna be doing a whole load of random tests to see if I can destroy these panniers. All of them will be filmed and put online for you to see, good or bad. So the question is, how do we destroy these panniers? Now don't get me wrong, at some point, we're gonna destroy these panniers. But we probably shouldn't put dynamite in straight away because we're limited to one of each type. So how do we destroy them? So Metamule are going to let anyone suggest how they think the best way to destroy their panniers would be. So you can go onto their Facebook page or on their Twitter or any other kind of social media things. Let them know how you want their panniers destroyed. We can try shooting them. We can try dropping them. We can try dunking them in the water for 24 hours, anything like that. Let us know what you want to do. Let us know what you think would be a great idea. Send them in and we shall film it and see how it goes. So yeah, go to the Metamule website and start coming up with ways to destroy their products. The Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure. Aha, got you. I didn't shave at all. Now it's time for Under the Visor with Claire Elsden. Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight. Proud sponsors of Under the Visor. Yes, uh, I'm Claire Elsden. 
Um, I rode from London to Cape Town about five years ago um, for a year on my own, just discovering Africa and life in general. And now I live in Tanzania, in Wanza, and I run Piccalilli, which is uh, Tanzania's first motorbike um, workshop specifically for women. So all our apprentices are women. And we started that about a year ago. Um, and now it's just kind of gone a bit crazy, uh, the demand that is for, for what we're doing. Because the crash rate amongst motorcycle taxi drivers out there is very, very high. So, for example, in the capital city in Dar es Salaam, there's actually a motorbike crash ward, which typically gets 50 new people coming into that day from having crashed on, on the road. But also, um, we're now running motorbike ambulances uh, for the local community as well. So that's a really exciting development. Basically, um, it turns out it's really hard to write a book and I have full massive respect for those who managed to do it. I started writing it and it was the most turgid, boring piece of material. Even I was bored reading it. So one day I will actually try and get around to writing it in a way that's actually interesting. But for me, blogging is really a joy. Writing a book somehow, can't do it. So far. So no progress, I'm afraid, on that front. Yeah, um, well, basically... Um, I'd re-entered the world of work, same as my sort of former job before the ship, really, which my heart was not in, but I was trying to work out what I was trying to do, basically. And then life basically took me back to Tanzania about three times in the course of one year. And one of those trips, and basically it just felt like coming home, getting off that plane, it was just breathing the African air, being back there again. For me, it's not stressful at all landing at Dar Ep or, or wherever else. It's just, it's just lovely. And I quickly, I was involved with um, training up uh, midwives in a project in southern Tanzania, which was a fascinating experience. But at the same time, that's when I started seeing just how many motorbikes were suddenly everywhere, which even two or three years earlier had not been the case. Because it's only been very recently, in the last seven years, that it's legal to ride a motorbike as a taxi. A lot of cheap Chinese motorbikes come on the market. And when you start hearing about the crash rates and the things that the, the problems that are happening as a result of that that could be avoided very easily with just a bit of training education and materials being available i just started thinking you know i've done this maintenance training before in malawi i've got a bit of an obsession for it really and i'm not ashamed of that uh, so i thought well maybe i could offer something here and it could help people and avoid some of these devastating casualties which, which have huge knock-on impacts so it was simply an idea of could we start up a motorbike maintenance workshop offering maintenance and road safety training as well and the reason why I wanted to have the apprentices as women was because I'd done some work in microfinance actually helping a microfinance organization in Malawi with their motorbikes and maintaining them and all of like, most of the people they lent to were women and if you invest in a woman in Africa typically they reinvest like 80% of what they make back into their families and their education and you really see a huge leap of progress so I kind of want to support that. And also there's an element where you, know, you just don't see many opportunities for women in engineering in Africa. And I thought we've got a really a, a nice opportunity to make a small change and give a few women an opportunity to become apprentices. So I thought it was worth giving that a shot. Yeah. Well, I think I kind of take life in five year chunks these days, really. And I think um, ultimately right now we're refurbishing two motorbike ambulances in our neighboring district. But those two were bought as a shipment of 400, an order of 400 motorbike ambulances about four or five years ago. Um, the ones we've seen, and we've seen quite a few, well, a decent number of them now, generally they're not working anymore. Generally they've done about a thousand kilometres and they just stopped working. It could be they had a puncture or something really simple went wrong and now they're sitting under a tree rotting somewhere. So our mission is to find all those 400 motorbike ambulances, renovate them, train up women to be dedicated riders who've had um, specific training on how to ride um, a sidecar, a motorbike in the sidecar, specifically off-road, all the training, the full, full works, and run that service to the local community and help to bring down the maternal mortality rate by providing transport to get from a village to a hospital. So until that's done, and that's going to be quite a lot of work, um, that's my planning horizon, basically, yeah. Well, um, these ones are e-rangers, so the way it works is you have a 200cc Jiling motorbike and it's um, attached to, effectively, a stretcher in a cage on wheels. And so um, it's a sidecar, so you can ride out um, averaging probably 15, 20 kilometres an hour. It's not a, supposed to be a fast moving thing, but it is designed to be off-road. And the reason why these things are so valuable over there is because... In Tanzania, the vast majority of people live in rural areas, so a car would find it very hard to reach some of those places. But also a motorbike ambulance is simply just a really cost-effective piece of kit if it's used properly. So um, it can deliver you know, far more um, 
emergency call outs and a car camp for the same budget. So it's actually a really good bit of kit. Um, and the best bit is as well, if you're picking up, say, a woman in labour, there is space on the back of the motorbike that maybe a relative or a traditional birth attendant or someone like that can come with them. So it's nice they don't feel completely on their own um, and it's a really great bit of kit. Yeah, so to, to explain, so um, at the moment it's registered in Tanzania, actually as a social enterprise, which legally they don't recognise. So legally there it's a business because we're doing business. You know, we're running a workshop, we're charging for those services. The women are earning an income from when they're charging those services. So legally there it's, it's a business. Runs the social enterprise, we reinvest all profits back into what we're doing. We're actually in the process of establishing a charity in the UK um, to, to help give comfort to people that, you know, the charity's commission are happy and therefore everything's... Uh, good and also just from a tax perspective a lot of people would prefer to donate to a, a charity so we're registering that at the moment and hopefully it'll be completed quite soon yeah well we um the project so it's called pick a lily so in this case it's p-i-k-i-l-i-l-y because in swahili a picky picky is a motorbike lily is a flower of women in connection so that's why we spell it like that although it's a tribute to my favorite chutney um so the website is there pickalily.com the Facebook page is just forward slash pick a lily. Um, people can stay in touch by watching our video diaries, which are pretty much once a week. And we do a quick two minute update from the workshop with our apprentices, the motorbike analysts is what's been going on. So if they hit our and like and follow our Facebook page, that's a great place to go. Or the website, they can join our newsletter that way. And that comes out about once a quarter. Um, if they want to support us, we do have PayPal links on the website, which we are always so grateful for anyone who sends us some cash. It all goes into the project directly. Um, and we are always interested in hearing from people who want to help us, whether it's um, they want to come out and volunteer, they're passing through anyway, they want to come in for a cup of tea and see what the workshop's like. We welcome those people. Um, we're a very lean team. So anyone who's prepared to give, say, two weeks to come out and spend some time with us, we're really grateful for that. Or if people have an idea as to a way to, um, maybe for example, we're thinking about starting something to collect used but still good quality helmets, bike kit, that kind of thing in the UK, somehow get them shipped to Tanzania and we can sell them in the workshop for a reasonable price because people cannot get hold of good kit. If people are keen to help coordinate that from the UK, we would really, really value that. So all ideas and input is welcome. Don't ride here. Ride here. Explore new horizons with Moto Freight, proud sponsors of Under the Visor. Thanks very much, Claire. Now, just a short segment coming up about packing stuff on your bike, and we're not talking about how to pack, we're just talking about differences between how much you can pack and how little you can pack. Welcome to Shays Hoskins. Now, it has been a long while since we've done anything on Adventure Bike TV about kit or kit tests. I was thinking on my bike trip with my buddies this summer about the difference between how much and what you can take if you're doing a road trip with full hard luggage versus if you're doing something pretty much all off-road and you've got to go as light as possible. Now, my trip this summer was going to ride the Davos de Stelvio Road a la Top Gear and do the Stelvio Pass, and I was riding with all my Metal Mule luggage. So it meant I could take pretty much anything I wanted. So here's everything I took. And as you can see, there was a lot of stuff. But what it meant was I could take pretty much anything I wanted. Of course, you got the essentials. I had to take my stove, and I had to take fuel for it, I had to take my sleeping bag, I had to take my Helenox bed, my Helenox chair, but also I could take some luxuries. So I could take a couple of different jackets. I could take shoes to go out in, as well as shoes to go walking in. I could take my speaker. I could also take my hammock and my bivy cover. I also had enough space for pretty much three or four days worth of food and a couple of bottles of booze. And even then, I had a little bit more space if I needed to put anything on top food-wise. But, Last year, when I rode the Pyrenees for seven days and I had to go as light as I possibly, possibly could, I took this much. So, what you will notice, first of all, of course, is the big difference here is the Metal Mule panniers are all missing. Now, the panniers by themselves, along with the racks, are somewhere between 18 and 20 kilos. So I've got somewhere between 18 and 20 kilos weight saving going off-road before I do anything else 
with my kit. So, in getting rid of the metal mule panniers and rack, I have had to replace them with something. So I've got a set of Krieger Overlander Enduro bags which hang over the saddle just behind my legs and they're 15 litres each. And I've stuck with a 30 litre Krieger bag as well for my tent and my Helinox bed and my Helinox chair. Now therein lies something, you know, for me, the Helinox bed is a lifesaver when it comes to my back. I wouldn't swap it for anything. And actually, in terms of weight and size, it's not that much different from a blow up bed. The Helinox chair, well, you could say, why take that? For me, after a day of riding off-road, and we were doing 10 hours plus a day across the Pyrenees, my legs and my back were killing me, and I needed somewhere comfortable to sit. So for me, that was an important luxury. So in terms of luxuries, there were a whole raft of things that I didn't need to take with me this time. I didn't need to have my speaker with me. I didn't need to have several different pairs of shoes, loads of different clothes, because we weren't going out at night. And slightly sadly, I didn't have my drone with me, although I did take a little pocket drone, just for the odd little shot. The other big change was with my cooking. So I've got an all-in-one jet boil there. That's my pot, my cooker, my fuel, all in one, rather than carrying three things all together. I did want to mention security. Now obviously with hard luggage, you can lock everything up. And on a trip on the road around Europe, that was hugely important to me because we were leaving our stuff outside of hotels or leaving them on campsites when we're going out. And everybody else who didn't have hard luggage was throwing all their important and valuable stuff in mine so I could lock it up. Of course, right across the Pyrenees, that just didn't matter because the bikes were with us all the time and we were wild camping. It really didn't make any difference. Now, I would never, ever try and tell someone how to pack their bikes because I think it is such a personal thing. But I wanted to illustrate here was just the difference it made between a tour when you're on tarmac and when you're off-road. And actually, until I'd laid it all out by this, I really didn't realise quite what difference it made. On last month's Travel Journal, we showed you the first episode of the first series of a Swedish motorbike adventurer. Now it's time to see the first episode of his second series. Okay, so we're here at uh, Borens Hult Slusa, which is the locks of Borens Hult. These five locks here, they are called um, the five locks of recollection. And it's believed 
to be in the memory of uh, Balza von Platzen. That's the guy who built the whole Jota. He didn't build it. He was in charge of building it. He probably never got dirt on his fingernails, but he was in charge of building it. And it's uh, in honor of the of the memory of Ben uh, from Pla of Platzen's kids. The digging of the whole Jota Canal took 22 years and the um, majority of the digging was made by soldiers I suppose better than killing each other build a canal, dig a canal another interesting fact is that the first ever railroad in Sweden was actually built to transport the soil away from when they were digging this canal so instead of using wheelbarrows and stuff they had a, a wagons pulled by horses uh, on rail and that was the first railway built in Sweden. So here's the boat coming in. Caliber is one of them as you can see. As you can see the, the, the bridge is uh, moving and leaving space for the boats to enter the locks. If you've seen any of my videos before, you're probably aware of how much I love those uh, hydro technical solutions. And this is this is one of the coolest ones. Um, it's basically a staircase for boats going down there. So you have a series of five locks, uh, and it's a part, obviously, of the uh, Jota Canal. And um, if you followed my videos when I, when I uh, rode around Vetten uh, and Vernon, the Great Lakes of Sweden, then you, you've seen Göta Canal before, but then in pissing rain. <laughs> uh, and me, really wet. So now they, uh, the boats are up there, and they're gonna open the hatches, and they're filling this basin here, so the boats can then come down to this level. And then they open here so the boat can come down to this level. Doing, 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 and bada bim, bada boom. Bob is your mother's brother. Right, so tell me that was not one of the coolest things you've ever seen. Okay, fair enough, but I think it's cool. Welcome to Kvarntorps Högen. Any place with a name that means pile of something obviously has to have to be visited 
and uh, here we are now and we're here for several reasons one of the reasons is that there is a staircase which is supposed to be demanding we're going to try to um, survive that and uh, this is a place which has almost fairy tale like Icelandic New Zealand kind of uh, attributes. These guys are dressed for training. I'm dressed for motorcycling. Right. I don't know. Look at this. Right. Okay, wish me luck. This, I don't know, this is, uh, why am I doing this? I could have, I could have ridden my bike all the way up, parked up there, filmed the staircase, and you know, that would be it. But no, I have to walk it. So anyway, during the World War II, oil supply to Sweden obviously was limited or non-existent so the government decided that they would try to get oil out of chist you know what chist is like slate <coughs> so 1940 they actually started this production here no, they ordered a company to start doing it. And 42, the production was there. Shit, man, this is horrible. Whew. Also, I'm not 25 anymore. So, annually, up to 1966, when it was closed, they produced 100,000 cubic meter of oil. <sighs> you know that scene in uh, Rocky where he's training and he's running up this, he, these stairs. When he gets up there, he makes this, whoa! Do, 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 do. There's no way I could have done that after walking those stairs. Oh. Right, so we're up here. And there's uh, it's like art, ex oh, coffee shop. I know what that's supposed to look like. That's supposed to be an arc. That's a funny coincidence as this felt like climbing Mount Ararat and then the ark standing up here. Okay, so this place is weird. It's uh, now it's getting cooler again, but up there so hot. This uh, oil that they were producing, they got it out of the rock from like in big furnaces. So they heated the stones up and oil came out. And then they just chopped everything here in a big pile, hence the name. <coughs> and uh, it's like six, seven hundred degrees inside the pile. And uh, when you walk around, feel heat just coming out of the ground and everybody else is dressed according to the weather we have 25 degrees like here up there I have no idea how hot it was so I had a, I just had a bottle of water and a coffee in the little coffee shop and then I had to get I had to get out of there it's too too hot but it's nice views kind of funny thing with the sculptures and this uh, artwork up there uh, and the staircase is just brilliant you know what they had to put up a barricade i'll show you when we get down there i can maybe i can just give you a picture here 
here now what it looks like this barricade because you know some people uh, found it funny to ride the staircase up on a on a motocross motorcycle i'm laughing because it's funny but it's really shit attitude to destroy it was like they had to rebuild the whole thing anyway we don't want that we don't want people to start hating motorcyclists so we don't do those things you hear I'm in a place called Kopperberg. Locals pronounce it Kopperberg. Anyway, there is a fairly well-known Swedish song, and it's about a man who is uh, in dire need of a sausage. In fact, he is so desperate for a sausage that he claims that if he doesn't get one, he will throw himself into the river in Kopperberg. This is not in any way like an official protest or anything. But I'm in Kopperberg and I'm having meatballs. And the river is right down there. So, call it what you want. Delicious. Okay, check it out. This is, uh, I came in over that bridge over there and then through town and up here over this bridge around and then I'm here at Leksand's Dyka Club. Dive club in Leksand. People I know from years and they're really good friends. And they, actually I was going to put the bike, uh, the, um, the tent where the bike is, but now they say, no, stay in the clubhouse. All right. Uh, so here is where Blue Betty is sleeping tonight. I might put her a little bit closer here. And I'm sleeping in here, check it out. This is, this is so cool. This is the dive club. Here they have their equipment. And here, look at this. Nice, so I, I use a couch, I use my, my uh, mattress, I don't know. Everything is here, I just, you know, go to bed. And here's a table where I'm going to sit and do a little video work. Hmm. Cool, huh? And here, these 
our steamers they used to work here in in the, in the river with the logging nice some of them are under construction not under construction they're like fixing them up it's really cool really nice place so i'm gonna go up to, and have a look around town and if you want you can come If you'd like to see some more from Anders, please click on the link in the description below. Now, if you like the show, which uh, I'd hope, if you're watching it, you do, please share us around the world because the more people that enjoy the show, the better. We'll see you next month. The Adventure Bike Shop, proud sponsors of Adventure Bike TV. Rubbish adverts. Greater adventure.